Welcome to How to Fake Properly. This is the second talk within our Python track here. And this is Donald up there. <laughs> and for those who attended the talk before, we heard uh, people are talking about Donald. Because Donald has kind a uh, tense relationship with media. Because sometimes he gets media shrapnel in the face. But on the other hand, and Donald explains about that. He talks about fake news then. But on the other hand, if on the other hand, if the press were to report that, for instance, Hillary Clinton is uh, suffering from an uncurable disease, Donald would say that's rather okay. So there's obviously um, a right way to fake news and a wrong way to fake news. So, of course, we don't talk about Donald today. Our topic is fake tests. And I guess this, we face the same issue here. There's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. I'm going to show you the right way today. So, before we start uh, with the talk, uh, just a few words about me. I work as a database engineer, and I'm currently busy with keeping Oracle Exadata systems up and running. So Exadata is an appliance built by Oracle, and it's kind of database machine. So, and in order to do this job, so, or, or this was my, this brought me to Python because I use Python to automate routine tasks. So that's my background. Yeah. Then the first thing we need to discuss is before I actually we talk about faking tests, we need to have a clear understanding about what what we need to test so about unit tests. So what are unit tests then? Um, a very basic uh, formulation would be a piece of software that, that tests part of your code base. That's a unit test. If you want to have it a bit more precise, um, you could formulate that you isolate a unit and validate its correctness. So what could be a unit then would be a function in your source code. And you, you want to make sure that it, that, it, that, it, that, it, sorry, that it is working. And once you have those unit tests, um, you can go a step further and you can start with test-driven development. And actually unit tests are the basic very basic bricks or the pillars for your test-driven development. Um, in test-driven development, you actually should, which is which was kind of kind of unusual for me. You actually should start writing tests before implementing functionality. And of course. Um, it is expected, or you should have a continuous integration pipeline, and there you would integrate your unit tests. And all common languages have frameworks for unit tests. So, for instance, there is JUnit for Java, there is NUnit for .NET, and of course, Python has its own framework. It's called PyTest. Um, let's start with an example, a, a very, very simple basic unit test. Uh, let's say we would implement a library which offers up some, some calculation functions. For instance, a division. So, and as we have heard before, we wouldn't start write our code, or implementing functionality. We start with our unit test. So the first unit test, rather easy. 
we would expect to have a library called matlib. And this matlib had one function division. And what we expect is that, with, that if we divide 4 pi 2, that the expected result is 2. But not too complicated. So let's see um, what happens if we run our first pi test, or if we run the pi test utility. And uh, one thing that you see here, PyTest is, is a rather comfortable tool because whenever you have a file that starts with test underline, and whenever it sees, PyTest will start to, to look into this file, and whenever it sees a function in there which starts with test underline, PyTest will execute it. Which is currently, of course, not the case. Because we only have implemented the unit test and nothing else. So let's implement our functionality. Now, this would be the code which um, actually does the division. So from the signature, two parameters, then we have an exception here because division by zero is not defined. And we treat with we treat that condition, and there's a result. So that's it. Running our unit test again will pass because four divided by two is two, and that's it. So this is your first unit test. Um, another thing to consider when dealing with unit test is code coverage. So what is code coverage then? Code coverage determines the percentage of code lines executed by a unit test. And it should be close to 100%. And in an ideal world, you would report this, your, your code coverage metrics, as part of your continuous integration pipeline. Um, Python provides a plugin for doing this, PyTest coverage. And this actually nicely integrates with Jenkins' Copertura plugin. So this, this is the bit that's generating your reports then. Um, let's have a look at the unit test we've written before in terms of code coverage. And here you can see how it's done. You have the dash dash coverage switch, and then it will run the unit test, which still passes, of course, and it gives you a coverage of your Matlib. This is the library which has implemented the functionality of 67%. Whereas, on the other hand, your unit test code itself is rated, your test code has also a coverage which is 100%. So in total, you have 80% coverage. Um, so what we learned before is we should come close to 100%. So let's go into this and have a look at why we have only 67% here. Well, if you have a look at the unit test here, then you see the second parameter differs from zero. So we have the green code path. So this is uh, checking if it's, it is not zero, doing the actual division. Uh, it doesn't go through the else pass, and then it returns a result. So the, this is four out of six lines, and that's your 67%. So we've learned before 100% or close to 100% would be good. So from that fact, we can conclude a test is missing. So let's fix this. So we have one test, which is uh, running the kind of good way. And we would need a second test who is running the else tree. And this is, this is done by the test here. 
In this case, if we do a division by theorem, we expect as a result uh, not the number. So let's see how this works. Well, here it is. Actually, two tests now, and code coverage is 100%. So now we are done. Um, one thing to consider is, um, given that we have 100% code coverage, would you say that, that, that this is okay, that, that now every, every possible case is covered? No opinion on that? Well, unfortunately, it isn't. And that's why there's another point to consider, which is called branch coverage. So let's have a look at, ex at an example here. We have this function called my partial function, and it takes one parameter, one argument, and it says if x is defined or true, then set y to 10 and return y. So if you were to test this function, and we would actually write a unit test with, which just calls it with one, which evaluates the true in Python, um, then we had 100% code coverage. Because the pass, if x is true, then this is, this is the case, because one is interpreted as two, then set y to 10, and then give your return value is 100% coverage. However, this code is bound to fail. Because if you would call that with an argument of zero, then Python would say, okay, x is zero, and zero evaluates false, then you would never set y to 10, uh, which gives you this error here. So even 100% code coverage isn't enough, unfortunately. Um, what we see here is the output from, from, from my more or less personal automation project. And this is, by the way, a Jenkins report. And it gives you an overview of, of your code coverage. And because the yellow line up there, that would be the branch coverage, the thing we discussed before. And I currently don't use it. That's why it's 100% there. On the other hand, what we can see here is that I only have a code coverage of 66%. So there's room for improvement. Um, why do I have only a 66%? Well, one of the factors is when I started coding this, I didn't use unit tests. So there's still some work to do. However, another thing is I'm, I'm dealing because it's, it's automating uh, operating and database things. I'm dealing a lot with, with calling a uh, library function from the operating system and stuff like that, which is kind of hard to test. So this brings us again to fake tests. Well, the good ones, those we need. Um, so what can you say about fake tests? Let's do, let's do an example here. Um, Let's assume we had kind the, a function that would send an email somewhere. And in our code, we had this line of code, which says send email dot send message. Just sends an administrator a notification message or so. Um, then we had in our code base send email. That's actually the implementation. And what it does is just um, using Python's SMTB lib. And 
and uh, we further assume that the localhost has kind of mail relay, and then it would send an email message. So, so far, so good. Um, if we would run this in a test site, that would spark off unintended emails. Because if I would say I want to test all of my functionality, because I want to have 100% of code coverage, I would of course send emails. Um, and this is probably a thing you don't want. And if you do trigger your, your continuous integration system by commit triggers, then you would get tons of emails. Um, on the other hand, and, and seen from a code coverage perspective, it's, it would suffice that you know in your, for, your, for your testing that just the line has been called. Because you can expect that sending an email works. The only, th or the, the crucial information is, um, it is sent. So, and we don't call it faking, so this is the fake. We don't call it faking, we, we talk about mock. So, I've actually put two definitions of mock here. One is the from, the first one is the from the Collins Dictionary. And it says, can uh, the thing is, you use mock to describe something which is not real or genuine, but which is intended to be very similar to the real thing. So this is this is kind kind of stuff that we want. And um, coming back to informatics and object-oriented programming, mock objects are simulated objects that mimic the behavior of real objects in controlled ways. And I guess this is exactly what we want, because we want to mimic the behavior of, of, of some part of code sending an email, but we want to do this controlled, and we probably don't want to send the email. Um, so what are the use cases for mocking then? Um, this is the first use case would be the, the one we discussed before. You just want to avoid undesired effects of API calls. Um, another use case could be that you kind of need to deal with non-deterministic results. For instance, current time. Let's say you would implement kind of scheduler system, and you want to ensure that that. Uh, certain things happen at certain times, every five minutes or, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning. And determining the current time from the operating system would, would hinder your testing progress, because you need to wait until it's one o'clock in the morning, which is probably something you don't want. Um, another thing is to mention is that you can by using more complex degrees, the runtime of your test site. Because it probably uh, involves complex setup stuff, especially if you work with databases and, and you need to kind of fill up a database, uh, which could take a certain amount of time, which, you, which isn't the thing that you want, because you want your tests to run fast. Um, and then, of course, you can deal in this scenario with, with states that are difficult to reproduce. For instance, if you had network errors, or if you kind of call an external API and, and you don't know what's coming back there. And this is aimed at, at cases where if you kind of lay it architecture, you, you could break the dependency chain within there. Um, and another thing to mention is you can reduce the complexity of your unit test setup in Deertown. So I guess I didn't mention that um, each unit test is expected to run on its own. 
So it shouldn't be dependent on any other unit test. And depending on the things you do, uh, the, the setup of the unit test, which is the step that you do before the unit test, can become quite complex. Because if you go back to our database example, um, preparing a database with, with a certain set of data, exactly that one the unit I test expects as an input can be time consuming. And then during the running the unit test, you kind of modify the database. So you need to clean up afterwards. And you do this for every single unit test. So this is a case where mocking can help you. Yeah, Python, of course, has an answer to all these uh, use cases. It's called unitest.mock. So what is unitest.mock then? It's a library for testing in Python. And this is actually from, from the online documentation. And I really like this, this definition here. Because what it does, it allows you to replace parts of your system under test with mock objects and then make assertions about how they have been used. So and and this is this is what you want, this kind of does the trick, you know. Just replace parts, put out this code which is sending an email, but still knowing that it has been called and knowing which parameters have been used. Uh, so let's, let's, let's have a look at example. Let's, let's see how, how you would do this. And in our example, uh, a very simple one, we just assume that we have a function which, uh, which gives us the current working path. And in order to do this, we use a library called from Python's operating system library, we use the get current working directory function. Once we retrieve the value which is returned the path. And this is it. So if we had this in a unit test environment, um, that would probably be a problem because you know your branches might change, your directories might change. So you probably want to, to replace this within the scope of the unit test, because your unit test should be independent. Each developer should, have, should be possible to check out all the source code, run its own set of tests, independent from, from the directory where he starts it. So how would we do this? Um, the first thing is to use the patch function of unitest.mock and we would start with with this this by the way is called a decorator in Python. We would start with this decorator and kind of announce that we don't want actually to call uh, the get current working directory function during our unit test. So to move on, then we can actually write our test code. And what happens is, because we, had, we have this decorator here, where we announced that we're going to patch something, and um, PyTest and path is on. The, this, because this in fact is creating the mock object, the thing we, does, we discussed before. And Python actually passes on this mock object to the test routine. So that's, that's why you use this parameter here. So once we have that, um, now, we can, now we can start faking. So how would, we, how would we fake our call? I mean, the thing is, we removed the operating library call. And now we need to, to have kind of return value, because the function is giving back a path. And we, we kind of need 
somehow to fake this buff, and this is actually what what the return value uh, attribute is good for. So the generated mock object, which has been passed on to a testing function, has an attribute called return value, and we uh, can set it. In this case, uh, to home dev admin mock code. So now we faked it. Good. Now it's time to move on. So everything is prepared here. So the next step we go is actually calling our test function. So what happens if we call the test function now? This is this and this this is this is this is the fake. Um, path isn't set to OS dot uh, get current working directory any longer, but the call is replaced with our magic mock object. This is exactly the object we created here with our batch, uh, with our batch decorator. So, and since it has a return value that we've set before, it hopefully will return this value. to the caller. And to finish up our unit test, we can check whether this is true or not. And this is it. This is faking. Yeah, and this will evaluate to true then. So there's still 20 minutes left. So we I mean, this is all you need to know about mocking, and I I'll just will go through some examples now for that it probably becomes more clearer. So um, this is actually the, the test case we have seen before, and now we see it in action. So the same procedure here. I added a print statement, which kind of gives you the current directory, only to see what's going on. And what we see here is, uh, if you start it, and I was in temp mock talk directory when starting this, um, it kind of works and gives you the right information. So what I have shown you before was dispatch decorator. Um, Another option in Python to do this would be uh, by means of a with clause. It's, it's just a different syntax here. Um, this is another way of how you could do a batch, because the decorator needs to be before your testing function. However, there might be cases when you say, I want to do it within my testing function for whatever reason, then you probably would use the with clause. And just because we talked before, we can make assertions about this mock object. Um, and in Python, there is this directory operator which shows you all the methods and attributes of an object. Um, this is called context manager, by the way. And here we can see uh, every all the mock all the possible mock methods. So what we have already seen was return value. This is kind. This is this is the fake. Um, what we see else here is um, you can make assertions about calls. So um, once you, I use quite often is assert called. So this is the example we talked before, sending this email, but, but faking it. And actually, I just want to know whether it has been called or not. This is where the function of the assert called attribute. Sometimes there are cases when you only want to ensure that it's called only once. For whatever reason, this is what assault called once does. Um, and and we will see it in, in, in the examples on the next slide. Uh, sometimes it is, it is of interest which parameters are you have been used for the calls. Because 
I do this a lot. I do kind of automation things like recovering databases or so, and then I'm interested in whether my Python code generates the right SQL commanders. So this is what asset called with would be used. And another thing, I don't have, have an example here, but this one is quite nice. Um, this is a side effects. And with side effects, you can ensure that if, if your mock get called, that some additional action is happening. You could trigger up another event or raise an exception or, or uh, whatever you want. And one noteworthy thing is add specification. Because sometimes you want to replace an object, but you want this object behave and have the same methods as the object that you mock. And this can be done by mock add specifications. Then your mock object is kind of enriched because it gets the parameters of, of the functions you mock out. Yeah. Um, so, as we have already discussed, you create mock objects. These mock objects offer you uh, functions and attributes where you can make assertions about its usage. So, to move on, here again our example. We have already seen it before, uh, now in action. And this, this example it's, is just to show you when you remember this code, we had this print statement in there. We said print the output of the operating system call. And here it shows you that it actually it is really replaced. It has been replaced by our magic mark object. Um, and of course, here's, here's the, the, the full version, the version that you would use in your code as well, um, which does fake the return value, and then it expects that this actually faked value is reported. And now here you see the full test run, and it's green, and green is passed, and that is OK. Yeah. And as opposed to the example before, because when you did don't set return value, you get back this mock object. Here you get the right output. So the print statement considers the faked return value. Um, now, coming to uh, examples from, from my production code, just, just to show you uh, how, how this works in production. Um, this, is, this is out of my code base, and what it does, it's just stopping a database. So not a very complicated thing to do. Um, however, in, in a cluster environment, you need the SRVCTL command. It's a parameter of stop um, database, and then you specify your database name. So, um, and here, here is why my code coverage is so low, because on my testing system, on the system where I run those unit tests, I do not have a cluster database. So, I, if I want to test this, I need to fake. And here again, we have already seen how it's done. So the first thing I need to do is actually to announce I want to fake something. In our case, I'm mocking out subprocess.check call. And then I need to pass on the mocked object to my testing routine. And, and that's, that's it, more or less. And then I don't, don't expect any return value here, no need to do further faking. Then I'm calling my method. 
is this one. With, with my set of parameters, I'm stopping the test database here. And actually, calling this code would, use, would fail in the testing system, because I do not have a cluster there. But it doesn't, because it faked it. And the only thing I'm interested, because I assume that this command is working, is whether it has been called with the right parameters. So in my case, whether uh, I stop the test database. And this is it. Yeah, here again. So, and this is often the case of, uh, in, in, my, in my tests, in the test, tests that I rate. Um, I'm not interested if, if an operating system command is, not, is working or not, because I expect it is working. I just want to know whether it has been called or not, and if and when this has been done with the right parameters. Yeah, here's another example. Uh, it shows you if you have actually two calls of the same function, which happens quite often. In this case, this is, this is a restore command, and a restore command, or a database restore has actually two parts. The one is restoring the database, and at the time when you restore the database, it's not open, nobody can access it for obvious reasons. And then afterwards, you just would, with the open command, make the database available to the public. Um, yeah, two calls with two different parameters. So how would you do this? Uh, again, we start announcing that we want to mock this call to SQL Plus, because I don't want to do it on the test system. I don't want to make a restore there. Then I write my test code. And then I run the restore procedure, and now you see a third any call in action, because a third any call I uh, will find out uh, because I have two calls here, and I need to know if if every single one of them has been called, which is done with a third any call. Yeah, the first one is the restore command. And the second one is the open database command, and that's it. Yeah, this brings me to the end of my talk, and I guess it's about 40 minutes or so, which is great. Um, just for those who want to know more about all these things, um, I put some references in there. Uh, one I'd like to mention, and it's, it's 1999, is Kent Beck, extreme programming. And Kent Beck is said to be the founder, uh, one of the founders uh, of this unit, stu unit test stuff, of test-driven development. And I would, I would say if you have some time, this is really a good read. This is a really a good read because uh, it's, it's, you know, he explains kind of the motivation behind all these things. And, I guess it will help every ambitious programmer. Um, the next thing in the references is uh, the mock library. So I just picked out a few examples. Um, if you want a complete documentation, you find it online in the Python documentation. And for those who want to just uh, get start playing with it, I found this one to be a very good resource because it has some easy examples and you will see a quick success here. Yeah, that's it. Uh, question and answers. Yeah. Um. Not a Python programmer, so I'll talk about C, but I assume that similar situations happen in Python. Okay. Assume I um, have to test a legacy component, and it's essentially a black box component. I don't want to change it. I know the code, but I don't want to change this because that's a problem. Um, assume that in my component I have, let's say, a couple of mallocs. And um, because I want to trigger specific um, failure situations, I want to let a specific call in a black, black box component fail. Um, 
in Python with this framework, is it possible to say, okay, um, don't replace any call with this name, but replace this call at a specific point? Um, yes, with a specific unit test for this. Okay. This is the way that I would do it. Then, then you had exactly, I mean, if you write a specific unit test for exactly your situation, I guess this is working. Because you do it on a unit test base or within a unit test. But um, as, assume I have in my unit, I have a couple of mallocs and um, the unit can fail at different points and this has different um, different results for my caller and I have to, ch have to check um, every situation individually. Um, then I cannot just say, okay, I have a unit test that tests a black box and I say, okay, in this black box, I want to have a system call fail, but I want to have a specific system call and I have different, I have the same kind of system call, at it's if but at different places. Freight, sound is there. Well, I never had this situation <laughs> and I'm afraid it isn't working. Okay. Further questions? Anybody? Good. Um, then just a last remark from my side. So what would be a call about unit test without or what I call the speaker unit test? So of course we want to evaluate the quality of our talks. And so if you liked the talk, leave a comment here. If you didn't like it, leave a comment as well, but be gentle, because you know, speakers are only human beings. And this brings me to an end, so the last thing I have to say is thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference.